What's up everyone? In today's video, we'll be discussing nonpolar covalent bonds, polar covalent bonds, and ionic bonds in the context of electronegativity. In my last educational video called Electronegativity, we defined electronegativity, we discussed the phenomena at the atomic level that are responsible for the differences in electronegativity among the elements, and we also observed some general trends in electronegativity in the periodic table. In other words, what happens to electronegativity as you travel down a group or from left to right across a period of the periodic table. If you're not super confident in your understanding of these topics, please, by all means, feel free to check out my electronegativity video. The link is in the description, and that will help bring you up to speed. All right, so by now you've probably heard that chemical bonding is broadly described in three main types, which are ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and the lesser talked about metallic bonding. Early on in our chemistry education, we learned that ionic bonding, which involves the transfer of electrons, occurs between metals and nonmetals, and that covalent bonding, which involves the sharing of electrons, occurs between nonmetals only. But we never really got an explanation as to why. Why does ionic bonding occur between metals and nonmetals, and why does covalent bonding occur between nonmetals only? Well, as you may have guessed, the answer has a lot to do with electronegativity, which, if you recall, electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself within a chemical bond. The type of bond that will form between two elements is determined by the difference in electronegativity between those two elements. Consider the bond between two chlorine atoms in a diatomic chlorine molecule. Since these two atoms are identical, their electronegativities are identical, and so the difference in electronegativity, which is symbolized by delta En, is zero in this case. This results in what we call a nonpolar covalent bond, also called a pure covalent bond, which is characterized by a completely equal sharing of electrons between the two bonded atoms. Neither one of those chlorine atoms has any more electron density than the other. This is hugely different from what happens when you have, say, sodium and chlorine. Chlorine is much more electronegative than sodium, so much more electronegative that we end up with a complete transfer of an electron from the sodium atom to the chlorine atom, resulting in an ionic bond. All right, so just to recap, so far we've seen that we get a nonpolar covalent bond when there's no difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, and that we get an ionic bond when there's a large difference in electronegativity between the two atoms. But there's also a third possibility, one that we touched on in the electronegativity video. Let's take a look at a hydrogen chloride molecule, the same example that we went over in the electronegativity video. In this case, there is a significant difference in electronegativity between these two elements, but that difference in electronegativity isn't quite large enough to result in a complete transfer of electrons from one atom to another. Instead, what we end up with is a bond in which the electrons are being shared between the two atoms, however, it's an unequal sharing of electrons. This is what we call a polar covalent bond, in which the more electronegative atom, in this case, the chlorine atom, is pulling more of that electron density toward itself, which gives it a partial negative charge. And that leaves the less electronegative atom, in this case, the hydrogen atom, with a partial positive charge. Okay, so we've got three categories, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic bonding. But in order to predict which of these categories apply to a given chemical bond, we need a way to quantify electronegativity and assign electronegativity values to each element. The most commonly used scale of electronegativity is called the Pauling scale, named after the American chemist Linus Pauling. And it ranges from 0.8 for the least electronegative element, which is francium, all the way to 4 for the most electronegative element, which is fluorine. This periodic table shows the electronegativity values for all the elements according to the Pauling scale. Notice that this table conforms to the general trends in electronegativity that we discussed in the previous video. That electronegativity decreases going down a group, and that electronegativity increases going from left to right across a period. In general, if the difference in electronegativity falls between 0 and 0 0.4, then you've got a nonpolar covalent bond, an equal sharing of electrons between the two atoms. If delta En is between 0 0.4 and 2.0, then this is considered a polar covalent bond, an unequal sharing of electrons resulting in partial positive and partial negative charges. 
And finally, if delta En is 2.0 or larger, then we've got an ionic bond in which electrons are completely transferred from the less electronegative atom to the more electronegative atom. So you may be asking yourself, well, what if delta En is 0.4 exactly? Would that be a nonpolar covalent bond or a polar covalent bond? Or what if delta En is 2.0 exactly? Would that be a polar covalent bond or would it be an ionic bond? Well, it's important to understand that these categories are not rigid, discrete categories. They exist in a continuum. However, they are still useful. To demonstrate what I mean, consider the difference between a puddle, a pond, and a lake. Could you accurately tell me how big a puddle must be such that one more drop of water will turn that puddle into a pond? Could you accurately tell me how big a pond must be such that one more drop will turn that pond into a lake? Well, I don't think you can, but you are more than welcome to prove me wrong in the comments if you like. But nonetheless, the terms puddle, pond, and lake are still useful when describing the size of a body of water. See what I mean? Just because the borders between categories that exist in a continuum are a little bit vague or a little bit imprecise doesn't necessarily mean that those categories are meaningless or useless or invalid. The same logic applies to nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic bonds. That is all for now. Thank you so much for watching. Please feel free to drop a like on this video if you think it's well deserved and don't forget to subscribe. Turn those notifications on so you will be notified the instant my next educational video is uploaded. And most importantly, please leave me your feedback in the form of a comment. I would wholeheartedly appreciate it. In order to grow and evolve as an educator, as a YouTuber, your feedback is absolutely essential. I need to know what I'm doing correctly, what I'm doing incorrectly, and also what type of content you'd like to see discussed on this channel in the future. Thanks again and take care.